Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, a shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice here at Retzel and Andrus. I'm with Christina Kuda, who's part of our healthcare practice and has been my most excellent guest many times. And today what we wanna talk about are dental deals. So we do a lot of transactions where we're buying or selling dental practices uh, and or helping dentists buy in or retire from dental practices. And these transactions sometimes have nuances that are a little bit different um, than medical deals or any other kind of deal. So I thought it'd be really helpful to all of our dental clients out there to talk about some of the issues that commonly arise uh, and to hopefully provide a little guidance on how they can handle them and really what we're seeing out there, um, you know, in the dental space. So Christina, I'm going to just kind of run through this with you as usual, but why don't we kind of talk about some of the issues um, that you're seeing as you're doing the dental deals? Sure. So like you said, dental deals are a little bit different animal than some of the other type of healthcare transactions that we work with. And one of the things at the beginning of the transaction really is uh, related to due diligence and sort of assessment of the purchase price. So when you're looking at physician practices and other healthcare type providers, they're very much dependent almost always on third party payers. So the way they bill, the way they collect, how their finances are done, what their accounts look like, the area are is very different than a dental practice, which is traditionally more a fee for service or more of an out of network type of payor. So for those reasons, how the purchase price is evaluated or how the due diligence of the financial records, balance sheets, taxes, et cetera, of a dental practice is a little bit different. So for that reason, we always recommend that if someone is going to buy a dental practice or sell a dental practice, that they involve accountants or financial advisors, or if there's going to be brokers involved that are familiar with the dental space and understand sort of the, the different nuances in how the AR and the financial matters of a dental practice may differ a little bit from a different type of medical practice that focuses a lot more on in-network provider billing and collection. Right. Well, a couple of things I'll mention though. Some There are obviously some dental practices that take insurance for sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues you and I get kind of frustrated on is um, that it can take time for somebody who's looking to buy a practice who recently formed it to get credentialed. And mm -hmm. a lot of times either they don't do it or their lawyers didn't know. And then suddenly they're acquiring a practice and guess what? They don't have insurance contracts. And so sometimes what we see happening is that they use the insurance contracts of the seller and they bill under the seller's number until they get their owner, maybe even in you know indefinitely and then don't do it correctly and this yeah. is is improper this mm -hmm. is illegal uh and um it's something that really needs to be avoided yeah i recently looked at a letter of intent that sort of addressed this related to a dental sale it said hey if you don't have your insurance contracts uh within six months after closing you could just keep using our insurance contracts and bill under our name that's insurance fraud now, there are proper ways to do that. We can do what we call lease back arrangements and transition service agreements. So there are ways that can sort of achieve the same purpose in a lawful manner. But unfortunately, what you and I see most often is, oh, yeah, it's fine. Just use my insurance contracts. That's absolutely not proper. And I can assure you that if an insurance company learned that was going on, it would be an issue. Uh, and one of the, the sort of outcomes of that be they're going to ask for all the money back that's been billed under the seller's insurance contract for services provided after closing. Absolutely. And, you know, a couple of other comments I'll make about kind of the financial piece. It's very common for uh, dental practices to go and just kind of get evaluation done by like Henry Schein or, or somewhere like this. Um, and I still think if you're the one buying the practice, uh, you really should have 
uh, a review done by your own financial advisor. Um, so you understand how they came up with it. And also, um, you know, so that you can make sure that it accurately reflects the financial due diligence. That's one thing. Sometimes people just assume that's the price and they don't evaluate it to see whether it really uh, can be maintained. The other common issue I see with dental practices is that, you know, the dental world is a small world. And in various cities, there are particular dental accountants that really handle a lot of the business. And sometimes I see both the buyer and seller and the practice sometimes too, all use the same accountant, right? <laughs> and uh, although, you know, I'm not questioning the integrity of any accountant, just like lawyers can't represent both parties on, on either side of a deal, uh, the accountant should not be doing that as well. You know, everybody deserves somebody who will advocate for them. Uh, particularly in a an arrangement where you're doing due diligence and you're looking at the numbers, et cetera, uh, unless everything's been agreed to and, you know, the appropriate consent is signed, et cetera, you really should have somebody who is uh, independent review um, your participation in that transaction. I don't know if you've seen that happen as well. I have, and you're absolutely right. It's very difficult, even for the best accountants with the best intentions, to kind of serve two parties because each party generally doesn't have the same interest, right? If you're the purchaser, you wanna pay fair market value, but sort of the, the least amount of fair market value for your practice. And if you're the seller, you wanna be paid fair market value, but sort of the most fair market value you can get for your practice. And I don't know as an accountant, how you can kind of juggle those two interests and really sort of fairly evaluate while you're representing both parties. It's it's a difficult right. thing to do. And uh, it's just not, it, it's messy. And I feel like everyone's best served sort of having their own financial representation. Right. And, and sometimes, and I mentioned we would touch upon this briefly, we help dentists who are buying, you know, maybe they've been working at a practice and they're buying into it. And the same issue arises as to sharing an accountant. So uh, in those type of deals, we often see some purchase price allocated to assets and another kind of using a compensation shift uh, pre-tax. Mm -hmm. And depending on the percentage of the purchase price allocated to each can greatly impact the tax repercussions. So even if you're just becoming an owner in an existing practice, and maybe down the road, you'll end up buying the whole thing. Um, or if you're buying a practice, 100% uh, allocation of purchase price uh, is really important from a tax perspective. And we've seen many purchase prices that are divided up uh, where some is paid at closing and some is seller finance. You know, what are the tax implications? Um, you know, so there's a lot of reasons to make sure you have somebody answering these questions for you to make sure it's the best deal possible or that the parties at least are meeting in the middle, I would say, mm -hmm. in terms of the repercussions. Yeah. And typically for tax purposes, what is a tax benefit to one party generally is a tax detriment to the other party. So it's very difficult to balance that and to sort of make both sides, you know, a hundred percent happy, um, which is why I think everybody needs their, their own advisor. I totally agree. All right. So let's move on. One of the issues you and I come across very often in the dental world, that isn't necessarily the case in the medical world has to do with dental work that has started but still needs to be finished, which we sometimes call work in process, or redos. So if you have a crown done and it breaks or, you know, it needs to be fixed or replaced, et cetera, which apparently is quite a common event, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how does that work when you're selling in between, um, you know, the initial work and the completion or the repair? So do you yeah. want to kind of speak to that and how we see that handled in deals. Sure. So work in progress has one of my favorite acronyms, which is WIP. So I'm <laughs> going to call it WIP for our discussion today. But WIP patients are generally patients where part of the service is before closing and the service will be finalized after closing. So when you have those in kind of patients, you have to think about a lot of things that should be documented in the purchase documents. So the first thing is you want to know the list of the WIP at closing. So you want to know what patients are we looking at here that have started treatments pre-closing but are going to finish after closing. 
And then you wanna look at who's gonna finish treatment after closing. And a lot of that depends on, is the seller dentist gonna still be around as a contractor or an employee of the purchaser's practice? Um, or are they not gonna be practicing dentistry anymore and not available? So who's actually gonna finish that service after closing? You also wanna look at how payments will be divided. So in some instances, we see a three different sort of payment issues with WIP. One is all the services have been paid for pre-closing but need to be finished post-closing. Some is partially paid pre-closing, partially paid after closing. And some is everything's being paid for the service after closing when it's completed. So you have to sort of determine how those monies are going to be divided between the buyer and seller. The seller's already been paid 100% for the WIP, but the purchaser is going to finish the WIP after closing. The purchaser should be compensated for that. So is there going to be a percentage of what's already been paid? And also, if there's a circumstance where, um, you know, the seller has already been compensated for all the, the amounts, but has also incurred all the lab fees, if the purchaser is going to finish the whip and get paid some of the fees for finishing, they also probably should share in some of the costs. So you really have to pay attention and look at where the money went for the service and where the cost went for the service. And the parties should agree in advance on how they are divided. Now I've worked on a number of transactions where everyone's friendly and the dentists know each other well, and they say, hey, we don't wanna put this in the agreement. We're just gonna say, we know there's WIP and we're gonna to agree to how to do it. And sometimes that works out great. The parties agree amongst themselves how they're gonna do it. There's not been an issue. But there's been a few instances where it's not turned out that way. And there's been a significant amount of WIP that maybe the purchaser didn't um, think it was gonna be that extensive. And the seller isn't really being forthcoming with if they've been paid or not been paid for the service. And the parties haven't been able to come to a meeting of the minds. And it's it's been an issue post-closing. So those really should be addressed in the APA, uh, asset purchase agreement or any kind of equity purchase agreement. Um, same thing with redo. So if someone's gonna come back in and have a problem with like a crown, for example, uh, you know, one of the things we look at is uh, how the redo is going to be handled. So will the dentist who originally did it, if they're still working there, be the one to finish it? Will the dentist who purchased the practice actually do the, the redo work? If new labs need services need to be offered, who's paying for that? Again, apportioning the fee, how redo will be handled from a fee perspective, and also the redo period. So I'm working on an uh, agreement somewhat recently where there was sort of a dispute between the parties where the purchaser wanted the redo period to apply from a year from closing, and the seller said, no, it's a year from the date of service. Well, if that in that example, if a patient received the service 11 months before closing, then the redo provision is only gonna apply essentially for one month after closing. That's 12 months from the service. That expectation was not what the purchaser had in mind. They wanted the redo provisions to apply for an entire post-closing year. So that's something to keep in mind. Also with redo, are there warranties? We often see in dental practice, warranties are given for certain services, um, not as common in a, a, a medical practice setting. And so are there warranties? What warranties were the patients given? What do the warranties say? How long do they last? Um, those are things the parties really need to consider and document uh, when they're moving forward with a transaction. All right, yeah, totally makes sense, especially because the buyer doesn't necessarily want to have to honor those warranties or guarantees. And in some cases, you and I have had a situation where the selling dentist did a particular type of service with a particular company and the buyer wasn't really going to be qualified to honor those services. So really there's some digging here. I know everybody thinks the dental sales are quick and easy, but a lot of times there's, there's a lack of thought put into some of these issues and, you know, as a result, there can be disputes. Um, all right, so let's also talk about some patient credits. Um, now, we know in medical practices, sometimes there's, there's patient credits as well, right? And often in, in medical practices, there's you know gift cards that need to be addressed in a, a deal. What kind of things are you seeing uh, in the dental world um, in this area? So oftentimes for dental practices, um, we do see that there are patient credits 
that exist in a, in a larger volume than you would see in other practices. A lot of times it's because um, the fee was accepted up front and the patient's insurance paid a certain portion, maybe it was out of network insurance and the dental practice has to refund some money to the patient. Um, a lot of times uh, we see the parties say, hey, we'll just handle it ourselves. We don't recommend that. Um, usually at closing, there is a list given that specifically says what patient credits are outstanding. And traditionally, um, it's recommended that the seller actually pay out those credits or the credits are taken out from the purchase price at closing in order to satisfy any amounts that are owed by the seller to patients before the purchaser takes over. Um, if that doesn't happen for some reason, uh, there should be something in the agreement that specifically says who is going to be responsible for those credits. So if the seller's not gonna pay them out before closing, the document should say seller's responsible and there should be an indemnification of liability for the purchaser against having to pay for those patient credits. And sometimes the practice uh, that's buying says, hey, we'll take over the credits and they've sort of allocated that already in determining the purchase price. That should be documented as well. The one thing this is really important for the purchaser is because if patients are due a credit and the practice is sold, they're going to go to the dentist office, which traditionally is the same space as before closing as after closing. And hopefully this patient's gonna continue with the new purchaser dentist. But the patient's gonna go and be mad. They're gonna say, hey, money's owed to me. And saying to the patient, well, it's owed by the seller or we're not sure about any credits, we don't know what's going on, could not be fantastic for business relations. So knowing in advance the credits are taken care of or knowing exactly who's owed a credit and how it's gonna be taken care of is very helpful. So if there is an issue with a patient, you can explain what's going on, explain how it's being dealt with, and hopefully the patient will walk away satisfied and not irritated that they're owed money and they're not sure how they're getting it. Right, great point. And on a related note, a lot of times in these deals, the um, the seller still needs to collect their accounts receivable and either they've worked something out to have people collecting it for them, or maybe they're even paying a percentage to the buyer to collect it for them. And what we don't ever want to see is the buyer uh, taking payments uh, that belong to the seller or wiping out an amount that might be owed to the seller uh, in the patient record right, which can interfere with the um, the seller's ability to kind of collect their AR and, and track what's been paid and who owes what to whom. And we've seen that happen. Um, so it's really important that how this is going to be handled be spelled out properly in the agreement as well. Absolutely. All right. So as a final point that we want to talk about is those types of deals where the seller uh, dentists or dentists, plural, uh, are staying on to work with the practice post-closing. Typically, they're an independent contractor, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I know that, um, you know, we often spend a lot of time trying to negotiate what that relationship is going to look like. And I know um, you probably have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, as you said, most often the dentist that stays on is usually an independent contractor. And one of the things you need to be concerned about when you're hiring someone as a contractor is that they are a true independent contractor based on IRS's standards. And there's some pretty stringent standards and the IRS as of late is been more apt to want to call contractors employees um, than, than actual true independent contractors. So one of the things we always recommend is that the purchaser contract with an entity owned by the seller and not with the seller as an individual. That's sort of one layer of insulation that makes it more likely that the IRS would view this as a contractor relationship versus a, an employment relationship. But it should be talked about at the beginning because that may involve the seller having to form a new entity. There may be tax consequences the seller has to consider um, having an entity and being paid through an entity. So it's something to sort of talk about at the beginning of the relationship. Um, another issue that generally comes up is in the dental field, there's often a lot of lab fees and different like um, equipment fees that go along with the services. So traditionally, and then pretty much most often, dentists are paid a percentage for services that they provide. So if their service is $1,000, they get 50% of that, let's say, they get paid $500. 
but you want to make sure that you include in an agreement how the cost for labs or supplies um, or you know equipment related to that actual service is going to be handled. So one of the ways that's often done is the compensation will say you're getting X percent of services you for collections for services you provided, but minus X percent of the associated lab fees, et cetera, costs for those services. That's something that's a little more unique to dentistry and not all buyers of a practice think of that. They just say, okay, well, we're going to pay you X percent, but they're not thinking about the fact that there's costs and expenses related to those services that the contractor likely should, should share with. Yeah. I think, you know, that often can be a big issue and also making sure that, you know, if the dentist, um, you know, doesn't get paid until collections start to come in following closing, that the parties are thinking about, um, you know, paying trailing collections following termination. That's something that people often, you know, forget to talk about as well. So really important to think I, through the whole picture. I've definitely seen agreements where there hasn't been a discussion of how long the contractor is going to be paid for collections trailing after the termination date. And there's been disputes between the parties. Should it be forever and ever? They're going to get it no matter if it comes in three years later, or, you know, do they not get anything as of the day of termination, if it's not collected before that day, don't get anything. And another issue that's kind of come up recently that I think is important to note is if a contractor comes to work for the practice, they're working for the practice. So that practice should be billing and collecting and paying the contractor. The contractor should not be paying the practice for use of a chair or use of personnel or use of equipment or supplies. That's not an arrangement where the uh, contractor dentist is just leasing space and leasing use of personnel as a totally independent practice. They're working for the practice. So the practice should be the one collecting and paying the contractor. Um, that's the proper way to document that relationship. And also, depending on your state law, there could be concerns that um, if the contractor is paying the practice a percentage of its income it receives, that that could be actually seen as paying for referrals in violation of, of law. So you need to be careful about how that's structured. Hey, great advice. Well, we could do a whole other podcast with some other issues. So we'll talk about doing that, but hopefully uh, this has been helpful. Uh, make sure that if you're buying or selling a dental or a medical practice that you're thinking about some of these issues and Hopefully you're working with a team that is familiar with these issues um, and, you know, can make the process a little bit uh, smoother for everyone and, and not miss anything that creates conflict down the road. So uh, thanks for joining us. This is the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler and Christina Kuda joined us today as well. If you want to see some of our other podcasts, you can check out ralaw.com or simply Google the Health Law Hotspot and you'll find us there. We'll see you next time. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.